Tomás Chuaki, soy profesor de teoría política en el Instituto de Ciencia Política de la Universidad, de esta universidad. Y esta iniciativa es organizada por la Facultad de Historia, Geografía y Ciencia Política de la Universidad Católica, junto a la Fundación Puerto de Ideas, y tiene como objetivo incentivar la reflexión en torno a las grandes ideas que están marcando a nuestra sociedad y contribuir al diálogo, la difusión, la democratización y la descentralización del conocimiento. Estamos muy honrados de inaugurar esta instancia junto a la destacada filósofa estadounidense Martha Nussbaum, con su conferencia El miedo y la ira, peligros para la democracia. Martha Nussbaum es profesora distinguida de Derecho y Ética en la cátedra Ernst Freund de la Universidad de Chicago. Ha publicado más de 20 libros, entre los que podemos destacar Crear capacidades, propuestas para el desarrollo humano, Las fronteras de la justicia, Consideraciones sobre la ejecución, La fragilidad del bien, Fortuna y ética en la tragedia y la filosofía griega, y La monarquía del miedo. Asimismo, ha sido distinguida, entre otros, con el Premio Príncipe de Asturias en Ciencias Sociales, el año 2021, por su contribución a las humanidades, la filosofía del derecho y de la política, y por su concepción ética del desarrollo económico. Además, también ha recibido el Premio Kioto en Artes y Filosofía, el año 2016, el Premio Bergruen, el 2018, y el Premio Holberg, el año 2021. Como se ve por los títulos de sus libros, el rango de temas que toca la profesora Nussbaum es realmente impresionante. Estamos seguros que todos gozaremos enormemente de esta charla, el miedo y la rabia como peligros para la democracia. Y además quisiera agregar una sola cosa, que no es solo un gran honor tener a la profesora Nussbaum inaugurando esta serie de cátedras, sino que además es particularmente apropiado que sea ella quien lo haga, ya que en su libro La monarquía del miedo, ella plantea la idea de que las universidades deberían bring the town to the campus, traer a la ciudad al campus. Y añade, esto no es un lujo, es parte de lo que es ser una institución educacional responsable en una democracia. Creo que esto eh, refleja muy bien el propósito de la serie de cátedras Puerto de Ideas Universidad Católica. Al final eh, podrá haber algunas preguntas del público. Eh, eh, hay público presente aquí también y también hay gente que lo está viendo por streaming, como también habrá eh, eh, un canal de YouTube por el cual se podrá ver esta presentación. So thank you, Professor Nussbaum. So good to see you. I can see you now. I didn't, I couldn't see you before. So now I can see you. And welcome. And I leave the floor to you. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for this invitation. It's really a, a strange world we're in where you can speak to people thousands of miles away. And it's a great pleasure because I visited Chile about eight years ago with great pleasure. And so now I'm visiting again. I'll begin with a Greek tragedy about the founding of democracy. As we'll see, it has a lot to say about our current moment. At the end of Aeschylus's Oresteia, two transformations take place in the city of Athens. One is famous, the other often neglected. In the famous transformation, the goddess Athena introduces legal institutions to replace and terminate the cycle of blood vengeance setting up a court of law with established procedures of evidence and argument and a jury selected by lot from the citizen body of Athens, she announces that blood guilt will from now on be settled by law rather than by the Furies, the ancient goddesses of revenge. But the Furies are not simply dismissed. Instead, Athena persuades them to join the city giving them a place of honor beneath the earth in recognition of their importance for the health of the city. Now, typically, Athena's move is understood to be a recognition that the legal system must incorporate and honor the retributive passions. These passions themselves remain unchanged, 
they simply have a, a new house built around them. The Furies agree to accept the constraints of law, but they retain an unchanged nature, dark and vindictive. That reading, however, ignores the second transformation, a transformation in the character of the Furies themselves. When the drama begins, the Furies are described as repulsive and horrifying. They're said to be black, disgusting. Their eyes are said to drip a hideous liquid. Apollo even says that they're vomiting up clots of blood that they've swallowed from their prey. They belong, he says, in some barbarian tyranny where cruelty reigns. Nor when they awaken do the Furies give the lie to that grim description. says, in your dream you pursue your prey, and you bark like a hunting dog, hot on the trail of blood. If the Furies are later given poetic speech, as of course tragedy demands, we're never to forget this initial characterization. What Aeschylus has done is to depict unbridled retributive anger. It is obsessive, destructive, existing only to inflict pain and ill. Apollo's idea is that this emotion belongs somewhere else, surely not in the law-abiding democracy. Unchanged then, these furies could not be at the foundation of a legal system in a society committed to the rule of law. You don't put wild dogs in a cage and come out with justice. But in fact, the furies do not make the transition to democracy unchanged. Until quite late in the drama, they are still their bestial selves, threatening to disgorge their venom on the land. But then, Athena persuades them to change themselves so as to join her enterprise. Lull to repose the bitter force of your black wave of anger, she tells them. But of course, this means a virtual change of identity. So bound up are they with anger's obsessive force. She offers them incentives to join the city, a place of honor in the democracy, reverence from the citizens, but only if they adopt a new range of sentiments, substituting future-directed benevolence for past-directed retribution. Perhaps most fundamental of all, they must learn to listen to the voice of persuasion. Well, they accept her offer and they say, from now on, we're going to express ourselves with gentle tempered intent. Each, they declare, should give generously to each in what they now call a mindset of common love. Not surprisingly, they're transformed physically in related ways. They apparently stand up for the procession that concludes the drama and they receive crimson robes from a group of Athenian citizens. So they become Athenians rather than beasts. Their very name is changed. They're now called the Eumenides, the kindly ones, not the Furies. This second transformation is just as significant as the first one and indeed crucial to the success of the first one. Aeschylus is showing that the democratic legal order can't just put a cage around retributive anger. It must fundamentally transform it from something barely human, obsessive, bloodthirsty, to something fully human, accepting of reasons, something that protects life rather than threatening it. The Furies are still needed because this is an imperfect world and there will always be crimes to be dealt with, but they are not wanted or needed in their original shape and form. They must become instruments of justice and human well-being. The city is liberated from the scourge of vindictive anger, which produces civil strife. In its place, the city gets forward-looking justice. Well, like modern democracies, the ancient Greek democracy had an anger problem. If you read the Greek historians, you see some things that are not at all unfamiliar. 
individuals litigating obsessively against people they blame for having wronged them, groups blaming other groups for their lack of power, citizens blaming prominent politicians and other elites for their lack of power, and selling out the dearest values of the democracy. Other groups blaming foreign visitors or even women for their own political and personal woes. The anger that the Greeks and later the Romans knew all too well was an anger full of fear at one's own human vulnerability. The Roman philosopher Lucretius even says that all political anger is an outgrowth of fear, of the terror of each human baby who comes into the world completely helpless and unlike all the other animals, can do nothing on its own to get what it needs. Lucretius sees that as life goes on, vulnerability continues or even increases since the awareness that we're going to die hits us hard at some point, making us realize that we're helpless with respect to the most important thing of all. This fear <coughs> of death, he says, makes everything worse, leading to political ills to which I'll return. But for now, let us focus on anger. The Greeks and Romans certainly saw a lot of anger around them. But as classical scholar, scholar William Harris showed in his fine book called Restraining Rage, they did not embrace or valorize anger. They did not define manliness in terms of anger. And indeed, as with those furies, they tended to impute it to women whom they saw as lacking in full adult rationality. However much they felt and expressed anger, they waged a cultural struggle against it, seeing it as destructive of human well-being and democratic institutions. The first word of Homer's Iliad is anger, the anger of Achilles that, as Homer goes on, brought thousandfold pains upon the Achaeans. And the Iliad's hopeful ending requires Achilles to give up his anger and to be reconciled with his former enemy, Priam, as both together acknowledge the frailties of human life. I believe the Greeks and Romans are right. Anger is a poison to democratic politics, and it's all the worse when fueled by a lurking fear and a sense of helplessness. I will conclude that we should resist anger in ourselves and in our political culture. But that idea is radical and evokes strong opposition. For anger with all its ugliness is a very popular emotion. Many people think it's impossible to care for justice without anger at injustice, and that anger should be encouraged as part of a transformative process. Many also believe that it's impossible for individuals to stand up for their own self-respect without anger, that someone who reacts to wrongs and insults without anger is spineless and downtrodden. Nor are these ideas confined to the sphere of personal relations. The most popular position in the sphere of criminal justice today is the position known as retributivism. That is the view that law ought to punish aggressors in a manner that embodies the spirit of justified retributive anger. Still, we may persist in an Aeschylean skepticism remembering that recent years have seen three noble and successful freedom movements conducted in a spirit of non-anger, those of Mohandas Gandhi, of Martin Luther King Jr., and of Nelson Mandela. Surely, people who stood up for their self-respect and that of others, and who did not acquiesce in injustice. I'm now going to argue that a philosophical analysis of anger can help us support these philosophies of non-anger showing why anger is fatally flawed from a normative viewpoint, sometimes incoherent, sometimes based on bad values, and especially poisonous when people use it to deflect attention from real problems that they feel powerless to solve. So, part one, the roots of anger rage ideas of unfairness. So let's now return briefly to that baby whom Lucretius brilliantly describes Babies at birth don't have anger as such, since anger requires causal thinking. 
someone did something bad to me. But quite soon, that idea creeps in. Those caretakers are not giving me what I desperately need. They did this to me. It's because of them that I'm cold, wet, and hungry. Experiences of being fed, held, and clothed quickly lead to expectations, expectations to demands, as instinctual self-love makes us value our own survival and comfort. But the self is, in a way, threatened by others when they don't do what we want and expect. Psychoanalyst Melanie Klein refers to this emotional reaction in infants as persecutory anxiety, since it is indeed fear, but fear coupled with an idea of a vague threat coming from outside. So I'd prefer to call it fear anger or fear blame. Now, if we weren't helpless, we would just go and get what we need. But since we are all initially helpless, we have to rely on others. They don't always give us what we need and then we lash out blaming them. Protest and blame are positive in a sense. They construct an orderly, purposive world in which I'm an agent making demands. My life is valuable. Things ought to be arranged so that I'm happy and my needs are met. That hasn't happened, so someone must be blamed. But retributive anger all too often infects the thought of blame and often of punishment. Namely, the people we blame ought to suffer for what they have done. Psychologist Paul Bloom has shown that retributive thinking, payback thinking, appears very early in the lives of infants, even before they begin to use language. He shows this by little dramas that he does with the infants with using puppets. So, so the infants are delighted when they see the bad person who is a puppet who has snatched something from another puppet beaten with a stick. Bloom calls this an early sense of justice. I prefer to call it the internal furies that inhabit us all and that are not securely linked to real justice. The infant's idea looks like a form of the lex talionis, that is an eye for an eye. It's not hard to imagine that that crude idea of proportional payback has an early and maybe even an evolutionary origin. It's a leap to call this an idea of justice, and I believe we should not make that leap. Part two, defining anger. So let's now fast forward to human adulthood. People now experience and express not just primitive anger, but full-fledged anger. But what is anger? Philosophers are fond of definitions which are useful to clear our heads. In this case, helping us to separate the potentially promising parts of anger from those that lead to nothing but trouble. And back to the Greeks, let me talk about Aristotle's definition since more or less all the definitions of anger in the Western philosophical tradition are modeled on it. According to Aristotle, anger is a response to a significant damage to something or someone that one cares about and the damage that the angry person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted. Aristotle adds that although the anger itself is painful, it contains within itself a pleasant hope or payback, or retribution. So we have significant damage pertaining to one's own values or circle of cares and wrongfulness. These two elements, I think, seem both true and uncontroversial. Those parts of anger can go wrong in specific and local ways. We might be wrong about who did the bad thing or how significant it was, or whether it was done wrongfully rather than accidentally, but they are often on target. More controversial, certainly, is Aristotle's idea that the angry person wants some type of payback and that this is a conceptual part of what anger is. All the Western philosophers who talk about anger do include this wish for payback as a conceptual element in anger. And I should add, it's also the case with Indian philosophers who define anger. But still, we need to pause because it's not obvious. We should understand that the wish for retribution can be a very subtle wish. The angry person doesn't need to wish to take revenge herself. She may simply want the law to punish the wrongdoer 
or even some type of divine justice. Or she may even more subtly simply want the wrongdoer's life to go very, very badly in the future, hoping, for example, that that second marriage of your betraying spouse will be a dismal failure. I think if we understand the wish in this broad way, Aristotle's right. Anger does contain a kind of strike back tendency, and that's what differentiates it from compassionate grieving. Contemporary psychologists who study anger empir empirically agree with Aristotle in seeing this double movement in it from pain inflicted to hope for payback. We should understand, however, that those two parts of anger might come apart. We can feel outrage at the wrongfulness of an act or an unjust state of affairs without wanting payback for the wrong done to us. And I'm gonna be arguing that the outrage part is personally and socially valuable when our beliefs are correct. We need to recognize wrongful acts and to protest them, expressing our concern for the violation of an important norm. And there's one species of anger, I believe, that is completely free of the retributive wish. Its entire content is, how outrageous that is, something must be done about that. So I call this form of anger transition anger because it expresses a protest, but it turns to face forward. It gets to work finding solutions rather than dwelling on the infliction of retrospective pain. Think about parents and children. Parents often feel that their children have acted wrongfully and they're outraged. They want to protest the wrong and somehow to hold the child accountable. But they usually avoid retributive payback. They rarely think, at least today, now you have to suffer for what you have done as if that by itself was a fitting response. Instead, they ask themselves, what sort of response will produce future improvement in the child? Usually this will not be a painful payback, and it certainly won't obey the lex talionis, an eye for an eye. If their child hits a playmate, parents do not hit their child as if that were what you deserve. Instead, they choose strategies that are firm enough to get the child's attention, and that express clearly that and how what the child did was wrong. And then they give positive suggestions for the future. So loving parents typically have the outrage part of anger without the payback part, where their children are concerned because they love them. That will be a clue to my positive proposal for democratic society, where I fear we do not always love our fellow citizens. Retributive wishes, however, are a deep part of human nature, fostered by some parts of the major religions and by many societal cultures, although they have been denounced by religious and social radicals from Jesus and the Buddha to Mohandas Gandhi. They may have served us well in a pre-social condition, deterring aggression, but the idea that pain is made good or assuaged by pain though extremely widespread, is a deceptive fiction. Killing the killer does not bring the dead back to life. Although the demand for capital punishment is endorsed by many families of victims as if it did somehow set things to rights. Pain for pain is an easy idea, but it's a false lure creating more pain instead of rectifying the problem. As Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. This wish for payback arises in all sorts of situations. Let's take divorce. Betrayed spouses often feel entitled to seek punitive divorce settlements and child custody arrangements as if that were somehow their due and as if punitive payback somehow restored the balance of power and rescued their damaged dignity. But in real life, the function of payback is usually far less benign. Two people become locked in a struggle for pain focused on the past and often inflicting great collateral damage on children and friends and family. In the end, the betrayer may get his comeuppance, but what does that actually achieve? Typically, it does not make the litigant's life better going forward by focusing obsessively on the past she may become close to new possibilities 
and she often becomes bitter and unpleasant. Retaliation is ugly, as Isco shows in his portrait of the Furies. What the payback seeker wants is future happiness and self-respect. Payback by itself never achieves that, and it usually makes the world a lot worse for all. But wait a minute. We all agree, don't we, that wrongful acts, if they're serious, should be punished, and punishment is typically painful. Yes, we should agree that punishment is often useful, but why and how? We might see punishment in a retributive spirit as payback for what has already occurred. That's the attitude I've been criticizing, and I think it does great social harm, leading to a gruesome pile on the misery strategy as if it really compensated for the damages of crime. But there's a better attitude, more like that of the parent, the loving parent, I should say, in my example. We might try to look to the future and produce a better society, using punishment when we do to express the value we attach to human life of safety, to deter other people from committing that same crime, and we hope deterring that individual from committing another crime. If we think this way, however, trying to improve the future, we probably will have a lot of other thoughts before we get to punishment. Like that good parent, we will realize that people don't do wrong nearly as often. If they are basically loved and respected, if they have enough to eat, if they get a decent education, if they have access to health care, and if they foresee a future of opportunity. So thinking about crime should lead us in the direction of designing a society in which people have fewer incentives to commit crime. When they do, despite our best efforts, then we take that seriously for the sake of the future. Now there's one more part to Aristotle's definition. He says that anger is always a response not to any old kind of damage, but only to the type that he calls a down ranking. This actually doesn't seem to be true all the time. I can get angry at wrongs done to other people without thinking of them as a down ranking of me. Later philosophers hold on to the other parts of Aristotle's definition, but drop this restriction. Anger can be a response to any wrongful act, not just a status injury. Still, let's think for a minute about Aristotle's idea, for it does cover surprisingly many cases of anger, as empirical researchers emphasize. The status idea is important because it's the one case, I believe, where payback really gives you what you want. If what you're focused on is not the murder or theft or rape itself, but only the way it has affected your relative status in the social world, then by pushing the wrongdoer relatively down, you do automatically push yourself relatively up. And if relative status is all that you care about, you needn't be worried that the underlying problems caused by the wrongful act, murder, rape, theft, have not been addressed. If you're thinking only about relative status, then payback sort of makes sense. Many people do think this way, and that may help explain why payback is so popular and why people don't quickly conclude that it's an empty diversion from the task of fixing the future. But what actually is wrong with the status idea? Focus on relative status was very common in ancient Greece and Rome. Indeed, it's what explains Achilles' anger when Agamemnon insults him by taking the woman that he thinks of as his. Focus on status was common too at the founding of the United States, as Lin-Manuel Miranda's brilliant musical Hamilton reminds us all. Elaborate codes of honor and status led indeed to constant status anxiety and to many duels responding to purported insults. What's wrong with the obsession with status, as indeed Hamilton shows, is that life is not all about status and reputation. It's about more substantial things, love, justice, work, and family. We all know people today who are obsessed with what other people think of them, who constantly scan social media to see who has been insulting them, Social media, I think, encourage this obsession as people are dissing each other all the time, 
counting the number of likes some post of theirs has garnered, and so on, as we live more and more in the eyes of others, more and more of our lives come in for rating, up or down. But isn't this obsession with status a sign of insecurity? And doesn't it actually increase insecurity, since the person who scans the world for signs of disfavor is sure to find many? Equally important, isn't the obsession with status a diversion from other more important values? Notice that the obsession with relative status is different from a focus on human dignity or self-respect, since dignity belongs to everyone and people are equal in dignity. So dignity does not establish a hierarchy and no one would or at least should be tempted to suppose that inflicting humiliation on someone else would raise up their human dignity. Dignity, unlike reputation, is equal and inalienable. So to summarize, we've seen three ways that anger can lead us astray. First, the obvious errors. Anger can be misguided and guide us badly if it's based on wrong information about who did what to whom, about whether the bad act was really done wrongfully rather than just by accident, and also if it's based on a confused sense of importance. Since we're often hasty when we're angry, these errors occur often. Second, the status error. We also go wrong, I claim, if we think relative status is hugely important and focus on that through the neglect of other things. This error is really a case of mistaking the importance of a particular value. Third, the payback error. Finally, we very often go wrong when we permit deeply ingrained retributive thoughts to take us over, making us think that pain wipes out pain, death wipes out murder, and so on. In short, when we think that inflicting pain in the present fixes the past, we go wrong because that thought is a kind of irrational magical thinking and it distracts us from the future, which we can change and often should. All of these three errors are common, not least in the political life. <coughs> Part three, anger, child of fear. Anger is a distinct emotion with distinctive thoughts. It looks manly and important, not at all fearful. Nonetheless, I say it is the offspring of fear. What do I mean? First, if we were not plagued by great vulnerability, we would probably never get angry. Lucretius imagines his gods as beings who are perfect and complete, living way far out in space beyond our world. And he says, they are not enslaved by gratitude, nor are they tainted by anger. If anger is a response to a significant damage inflicted by someone else on you or someone or something you care about, then a person who is complete, who cannot be damaged, has no room for anger. Judeo-Christian pictures of divine anger imagine God as loving humans and therefore as deeply vulnerable to their misdeeds. Some moral reformers have urged us to become like Lucretius's gods. The Greek Stoics thought that we should learn not to care at all about what they called the good of fortunes. That is anything that can be damaged outside our own control. Then we would lose fear and in the bargain, we lose anger. Gandhi's views were very close to those of the Stoics. The problem, however, is that in losing fear, we also lose love. There's nothing that makes us more vulnerable. And we know this, especially in this particular era of our world, than loving other people or loving a country. So much can go wrong. In one half year, the Roman philosopher and statesman Cicero said that he lost the two things he loved most in the world, when his daughter Tullia died in childbirth and the Roman Republic collapsed into tyranny. Even though his friends thought his grief was excessive and urged him to be a proper Stoic, he told his best friend Atticus that he could not stop grieving and furthermore, he did not think he should. Taking the measure of love fully means suffering. So the solution that wipes out 
both fear and anger with one stroke is not one that we should accept. Keeping love means keeping at least quite a lot of fear. And though that doesn't necessarily mean keeping anger, it makes us much more vexed. It makes it a lot harder to win the struggle with anger. Fear is not only a necessary precondition for anger, it's also, as it were, an accelerant to anger, feeding the, four, the three errors. When we're afraid, we leap to conclusions, lashing out before we thought carefully about the who and the how. When problems are complex and their causes poorly understood, as economic problems tend to be, fear often leads us to pin blame on individuals or groups conducting witch hunts rather than pausing to figure things out. Fear also fuels obsession with relative status. When people feel bigger than others, they think they can't be destroyed. But when people protect their vulnerable egos by thoughts of status, they can easily be goaded into anger because life is full of insults. And fear also feeds the focus on payback, since vulnerable people think that getting back at wrongdoers and even wiping them out completely is a way of reestablishing lost control and dignity. Lucretius even traces all war to fear. He omits the obvious possibility that war may be caused by a reasonable reaction to a genuine threat to our safety and our values. So I think we should not accept his analysis fully. I'm not a pacifist, nor were my primary heroes of non-anger, Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela. Gandhi, I think, made a large mistake by endorsing total pacifism. But even just wars, which I believe the Second World War was, are often marred by zeal for the blood of the aggressor. And one could certainly argue that episodes such as the bombing of Dresden were motivated by payback thinking rather than sound policy. Great leaders understand that we need to retain and fortify the spirit of determined protest against wrongdoing without comforting our egos with retributive thinking. The brilliant speech in which Winston Churchill said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, refers to danger, to struggle, and to a willingness to accept great pain in order to preserve democratic values. It is conspicuous for its utter lack of retributivism. Churchill does not say wiping out the Nazis will remove the threat to freedom. Freedom is beautiful and we must be prepared to suffer for it, but we must focus on defending what we love rather than disgorging our venom on the land, as Eastland's Furies put it. Churchill's speech is of a piece with the best allied aims to rebuild Germany after the war. And we can now see the wisdom of that course as Germany is among the strongest and most viable democratic states. Part four and last, protest without payback. So what's the alternative? We can keep the spirit of determined protest against injustice while saying goodbye to the empty fantasy of payback. This forward-looking strategy includes protesting wrongdoing when it occurs, but not imputing wrongdoing, where there is instead the murky thicket of the global economy to manage, outsourcing and automation to reconcile with our citizens' welfare. Never seizing hold of blame as a substitute for a feeling of powerlessness, but also not yielding to despair. So to conclude, I, I wanna study just one example of protest without payback, the ideas of Martin Luther King Jr who contributed so much to my society's ongoing struggle with racism and its search for justice. King always said that anger had a limited usefulness and that it brought people into his movement rather than sitting at home in despair. But once they got there, he said, the anger had to be purified and channelized, to use those two words. What he meant is that people must give up the payback part of anger and yet keep the spirit of justified protest. Instead of retribution, they need hope and faith in the possibility of justice. In an essay written in 1959,
King says that the struggle for integration will continue to encounter obstacles and that these obstacles can be met in two very different ways. Quote, one is the development of a wholesome social organization to resist with effective firm measures any efforts to impede progress. The other is a confused, anger-motivated drive to strike back violently to inflict damage. Primarily, it seeks to cause injury, to retaliate for wrongful suffering. It is punitive, not radical or constructive. It's very, I think, interesting that he says not radical, and I agree. King, of course, was characterizing not just a deep-seated human tendency, but the actual ideas of Malcolm X as he understood them. King insisted constantly that his approach did not mean acquiescing in injustice. There's still an urgent demand. There's still a protest against unjust conditions in which the protester takes great risks with his or her body in what King called direct action. Still, the protester's focus must turn to the future that all must join to create together with hope and with faith in the possibility of justice. King, in short, favors and exemplifies what I have called transition anger, the protest part of anger without the payback. But to see this better, let me study the sequence of emotions in his famous I Have a Dream speech. King begins, indeed, with what looks like a summons to anger. He points to the wrongful injuries of racism, which have failed to fulfill the nation's implicit promise of racial equality. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, he says, quote, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. The next move King makes is significant, for instead of going on to demonize white Americans, or call for their blood, he calmly compares them to people who have defaulted on a financial obligation. Quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. So this begins the shift to what I've called transition anger, for it makes us think ahead in non-retributive ways. The essential question is not how whites can be destroyed, but how can this debt be paid? And in the financial metaphor, the thought of destroying the debtor is not likely to be central. The future now takes over as King focuses on a time in which all may join together in pursuing justice and honoring obligations. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So no mention again of torment or payback, only of determination to ensure the protection of civil rights at last. King reminds his audience that the moment is urgent and that there's actually a danger of rage spilling over, but he repudiates that behavior in advance. Quote, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And that term, soul force, he took from Gandhi. So the payback is reconceived as a vindication of civil rights, a process that unites black and white in a quest for freedom and justice. Everyone benefits, as many white people already recognize, he says, quote, their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. King next repudiates a despair that could lead to the abandonment of effort. And it's at this point that the most famous part of the speech, the I have a dream part, takes flight. And of course, this dream is not one of retributive punishment but one of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. In short, it's not the book of Revelation, it's from the prophets. In pointed terms, King invites the African-American members of his audience to imagine future brotherhood, even with their former tormentors. I have a dream 
that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. There is indeed outrage in this speech and the outrage summons up a vision of rectification which might easily have taken a retributive form. But King gets busy right away reshaping retributivism into work and hope. For how sanely and really could injustice be made good by retributive payback? The oppressor's pain and lowering do not make the afflicted free. Only an intelligent and imaginative effort toward justice can do that. It might seem strange to compare King to Aeschylus, but it's not really strange at all, given King's vast learning in literature and philosophy. He's basically saying the same thing. Democracy must give up the empty and destructive thought of payback and move toward a future of legal justice and human well-being. King's opponents portrayed his stance as weak. Malcolm, <clears throat> Malcolm X said sardonically, it's like coffee that has had so much milk poured into it that it's white and cold and doesn't even taste like coffee. But he was wrong. King's stance is strong, not weak. He resists one of the most powerful of human impulses, the retributive impulse for the sake of the future. One of the trickiest problems in politics is to persist in a determined search for solutions without letting fear deflect us onto the track of anger's errors. The idea that Aeschylus and King share is that democratic citizens should face with courage the problems and yes, the outrageous injustices that we encounter in political and social life. Lashing out in anger and fear does not solve these problems. Instead, it leads as it did in both Athens and Rome, to a spiral of retributive violence. Lucretius tells a grim tale of human anger and fear run wild. He imagines a world not unlike his own Roman world, in which insecurity leads to acts of aggression, which do not quiet the insecurity. At the time he was writing, the Roman Republic was collapsing and insecurity mounting everywhere would shortly give way to tyranny. In an effort to quiet fear, he imagines, people get more and more aggressive until they think up a clever new way to inflict maximum damage on enemies, namely putting wild beasts to work in the military. They even tried out bulls in the service of war. They practiced letting wild boars loose against their enemies. They even used fierce lions as an advanced guard, equipped with a special force of armed and ferocious trainers to hold them in check and keep them in harness. It was no use. The lions, hot with blood, broke ranks wildly, trampled the troops, tossing their manes, and then in a poetic tour de force, Lucretius goes on for about another 30 lines, imagining the carnage that these animals unleash. Then he pulls back. Did this really happen, he says? Well, maybe it happened in some other world way out in space. And what, he says, did these fictional people wish to accomplish? To inflict great pain on their enemies, even if it meant that they would perish themselves. Lucretius' point, of course, is that our retributive emotions are those wild beasts. People may think anger powerful, but it always gets out of hand 
and turns back on us. And yet worse, half the time, people don't really care. They're so deeply sunk in payback fantasies that they prefer to accomplish nothing so long as they make those people suffer. His grim science fiction fantasy reminds us that we'll always defeat ourselves so long as we let ourselves be governed by fear, anger, and the politics of retribution. There is a better alternative. Aeschylus knew it and King both knew and lived it, indeed died for it. Making a future of justice and well-being is hard. It requires self-examination, personal risk, searching critical arguments, and uncertain initiatives to make common cause with opponents in a spirit of hope and what we could call rational faith. It's a difficult goal, but it's that goal I am recommending for both individuals and institutions. Now, we all need to try our best to make it a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nussbaum, for a wonderful uh, presentation. I've been asked to uh, get things started in the Q&A with a question <laughs> of my own. It's not that I'm putting myself at the top of the list. I've been asked to do so, so for, forgive me for doing so. Um, I know that you, that you know uh, Paul Woodruff's work, uh, uh, The Ajax Dilemma, his, his book. I know because you have a blurb on the back of it, and it's a, it's a very positive uh, blurb yeah. about that work. Um, but at the same time, your ideas seem to be quite distant from Paul Woodruff's. And I, I, and, and I, I realize that you would think, I, I believe, that the, the, the example of Ajax and Sophocles' um, play, uh, Tragedy, is a, is a case of status, uh, of, of wrongful, um, uh, giving right. wrongful importance to status. But Paul Woodruff makes a, an, also a different point about that case. And he says that, that Ajax sort of kept his anger pent up within himself for a long time while he was this brave uh, soldier and then finally sort of exploded and let it all out. So my, my question is, if you think that what you call transitional anger uh, might not also be a form of keeping anger proper pent up and finally sort of exploding, um, the, the question perhaps is how long does a transition have to be? How, I, and even, I, and I was thinking even in the case of Mandela, who you know at a certain point decided that acts of sabotage to infrastructure, not against uh, human beings, of course, but he decided that acts of sabotage were were actually appropriate. So uh, I wonder if you have anything to say about that. And, and is transitional anger actually a a powerful enough outlet, uh, let us say, to the to the well, passion? Yeah, okay, first of all, I do think Woodruff's book is a brilliant way of reading a Greek tragedy and showing what its implications might be for us today, but, but I don't agree with lots of it. I'm mean, happy to praise many things that I don't agree with. Uh, and in this case, I think the first problem with Ajax's anger is that it's focused on status. Now, of course, in that world, this hero culture with no clear political structure, there weren't very many other options for him. But Odysseus actually shows better options, thinking ahead to the welfare of everyone. And he, Woodruff does recognize that. So I think that really what should happen is a, a transition from one's egotistical demand for status rep, retribution to a concern for the well-being of everyone. And Achilles does eventually achieve that. So one problem, of course, with the Greek myths is they take different parts of different myths and have different interpretations of them. But if you think about Homer, the Iliad is not a validation of retributive anger. It's actually the opposite. It's a validation of what I call transition anger because Achilles and Priam are reconciled thinking about the vulnerability of human life. And then of course that would issue, let's hope, in a better governed society. And that's, I think, what uh, Aeschylus uh, saw as the right direction. So, so I, I, that's what I think about Ajax, that he was childish and that he was boxed in by himself. Now, what King, King used these two words, purified and channelized. He did not say the people who came to his movement had to just 
give up their anger or far less suppress it, hold it in. No, they channel it into a productive direction. That's what protest marches are. You got something to do and you even have big risks to run. That's why he used this term direct action. You know, you act, but for the sake of law and for a future of justice, not for the sake of retribution. So the channeling of anger is the important thing. You don't give it up. You use its energy to do something and to do something useful and good. <coughs> now Mandela, look, uh, there's a distinction between non-anger and non-violence. I am not a pacifist, as I already said in the talk. I think sometimes violence may be the only way of serving the cause of justice. And Mandela came to the same conclusion after trying everything else for a long time. And as you mentioned, he, he used violence in a very limited form uh, against buildings and so forth, not against people. But he always was against anger. He says often, and I've read all his letters and countless speeches and so on, that his biggest struggle while he was in prison for 27 years was to meditate about his own retributive anger and to try to, well, not to get rid of it, as I said, but to channel it in a more productive and useful direction for the good of all of South Africa. Now, one thing he did, we now know in that prison, was to read the works of both Aeschylus, or well, with Sophocles anyway, they put on a version of the Antigone, and the works of Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher who, who taught people to turn their anger into concern for the whole, concern for all human beings. And again and again, he tells the people in his movement, and this is something I, I go into great length about in my book, Anger and Forgiveness, so you can look it up there, but people who wanted to be retributed, and he says, no, we're building a society, and what we have to do is think what will do that. So, for example, the famous instance of the rugby team. So rugby was a white Afrikaner sport and therefore a lot of racists were rugby fans. So Mandela's followers thought, let's get rid of it. Let's not have rugby as a team of the nation. And as the movie Invictus shows us very beautifully with that wonderful performance by Morgan Freeman, what had to happen, Mandela thought, was to bring black Africans into rugby. So he arranged to do that and made it a sport that really was a sport of the whole nation. And that point in the rugby final, where the whole stadium, black and white together, chanted out Mandela, 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 showed the wisdom of that policy. The other similar instance is the national anthem. So, of course, national anthems have great symbolic force. And the Afrikaner national anthem was hated, hated by Mandela's followers. They wanted to get rid of it. But Mandela knew, just as he knew that sports have great emotional force for nation building, he knew that music has great emotional force. And so instead of replacing it by the freedom anthem, Minkosi Sikalele Africa, he decided to find a version that would put the two together. So the anthem that's now sung has one verse in Afrikaans and then one verse that's from Minkosi Sikalele Africa in four different African languages. And the third stanza, in English, knitting the whole thing together. So he was a brilliant unifier. And he did that because he, he had freed himself from the grip of retributive thinking. Thank you very much. We, we have some questions that are coming in through uh, uh, people who are watching uh, this through streaming. Um, first one, uh, Carmen asks, how have you seen fear working in the politics around COVID-19? Where is the limit there? Well, of course, I, I never said we should never have any fear. If we didn't have fear, we'd all be dead. We do things every day, like eating decent food, exercising, not running out into traffic and stuff, that express a kind of rational fear of death. And I think the fear of death is rational. Uh, it's good to protect our lives. And so when a dangerous illness comes along, or a dangerous hurricane or anything else, we have to, we ought to take the measure of that danger. And in the case of COVID, it was very great and do the things that will protect human life. And uh, I would hope the lives, not just of our own group, but the lives of everyone. So uh, there was a lot of that. And I think the scientists worked heroically 
both to discover and market the vaccines and then to try to tell people about the disease and convince them of the scientific facts. But the fear, you know, it runs them up and, and fear sometimes has a kind of um, backlash so that instead of having the rational fear, and let's say going out and getting the vaccine or wearing the mask, people turn around and they, they deny the fear. And they, I think it's caused by the fear itself. Lucretius points this out. He says one of the conclusion, concluding effects of fear is that it makes people kill themselves. And I think that's what we see uh, is that people, you know, by trying to be tough and deny the fear, they deflect it into retributive blame of the scientists and the mask mandates and so forth. And in so doing, they put all of us in danger. I mean, it's just uh, crazy, you know. The United States is such a rich nation and it could have had herd immunity by now. But people, I won't say they didn't have enough fear because I think they did have fear. <laughs> but instead of being motivated by the rational part of that fear, they deflected it into a kind of paranoid reaction against science and truth. And so we have the result that cases are rising in Chicago and everywhere. I was just told this morning that my own rabbi on Yom Kippur is not going to be able to be in the synagogue because his family has a case of COVID. You know, so it, it just needn't have happened that way. So this terrible pathology of fear turning into anger rather than De deflecting us toward a rational action is what we very often see. So that's one thing we see. And then, then of course, there are all kinds of other pathological reactions of despair and blame of immigrants, blame of Asians. You know, I don't think you probably have so much of that, but there's tremendous hatred and hate crimes directed against Asians as a result of people's fear. But, but instead of looking for the causes, they just blame everyone who has an Asian appearance. And it's dangerous and terrible. And the, the number of, of hate crimes against Asians has risen tr dramatically. So anyway, we see both the good fear, which has produced great scientific achievements and uh, great policies promulgating those achievements, but then all the bad stuff too. whether suffering as punishment or suffering that results from punishment can be achieved better through what he calls penal abolitionism and or the uh, abolition of, um, of penitentiary institutions? Well, look, um, I do think that we use incarceration much, much too often as though it's like a universal panacea for crime. And as I said in the talk, the first thing that we should do if we're really serious about crime is get serious about the underlying causes. What's happening to young people who <clears throat> don't, have <clears throat> don't have enough education, don't have employment opportunities, don't have access to health care, and, and so forth. And, and so what we should do is fix those problems as best we can. And it's very, very hard to do inequality in our society and probably in most societies is so deep-seated that fixing it is a long-term proposition. So people don't want to wait and they don't want to do the hard work and effort. So they'd rather use mass incarceration and that is certainly wrong. But I also think that, you know, look, the purpose I see in punishment is there are several purposes. There's education, expression of society's important values, and above all, deterrence. Now, if you think about what should achieve those goals, I think a policy of total non-incarceration, which of course serves also the function of incapacitation of the criminal, would probably not serve those goals very well because it, it doesn't exactly educate. It makes people think, oh, well, crime has no bad consequences and it doesn't have um, enough uh, expressive value. It says, well, uh, we don't care very much about crime. And it certainly does not deter. Now, what would deter? I mean, our problem in Chicago is particularly gangs. And we're now engaged in a long searching inquiry into what, what we can do to bring down the homicide rate caused by gangs that you know, batten on the community like a plague 
and use the young people and lure them in and so on. Uh, what our mayor has just decided she wants to do is to use civil suits to try to get their assets away from them. We'll see, I mean, because she thinks really they're a kind of organized crime, and they are, right? And they, what they want is money from drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And so the best thing to do is to take away their assets. I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly is one, one of the things we better try. But in so far as they're out there murdering people, and you know, it's not just murdering one another. It's they often deliberately murder family members, children, and so on, just to make the point about their power. You better not cross them. You know, we I think we have to use incarceration to some extent, but smartly and not in the way that it's often done, just as though, oh, that's that will make the whole problem go away. Christina asks, how can a society produce a new generation built on compassion and the mindset of common love if its elements, its members, are submerged in a culture of fear and anger? <laughs> well, you know, we who are educators, we got to do what we can. And I mean, obviously, a lot of this has to happen when children are very young and in families. And That's the part that the educators have basically no control over. So we just have to write what we can and speak what we can and hope that parents hear that message. And we hope that the, the religions also help us give that message. As I think in my own city, the black churches have very much helped communicating the message of non-anger and brotherly love and reconciliation. So we, we just have to keep trying. And if children are malleable at all, and I think they are malleable when they're, let's say, just getting to university, we have to hope that we can bring them together. Now, of course, one result of the polarization of my society is that people with different political positions don't want to be in the same class. I used to, like when I first came to University of Chicago in 1995, when I taught feminist philosophy, I would have people from all parts of the political spectrum signing up for that class. My most right-wing colleague was actually a student in that class back in the late 90s. But today, things are so polarized that people don't want to even have on their transcript a class that indicates that they listen to a left-wing voice or a right-wing voice. So what can we do then? Well, I have a one remedy that I've tried to have is co-teaching with somebody whose values are different. And that's very helpful. We each bring our constituents as it were, into the classroom, and then they talk, let's hope, and, and it has worked quite well if we structure the discussion well. They talk civilly and respectfully to each other, but that is just one class, and it might have 20 people. So another thing that I've tried, and I actually gave a, a gift to the law school when I won the Vergruen Prize, to set up a series of lunches, which are now known as the Nussbaum lunches, Because people don't want to take a whole course in something that's opposed to their values, but they might be willing to sit down with the opposing side for an hour and a half at lunch. So two faculty members with contrasting views say, we are going to offer a Nussbaum lunch on the following topic. Nice food is provided, and about 20 students sign up. And they say when they sign up, this is my initial view of the situation. And students love these. They really are always oversubscribed. I've done a couple. One was on the whole controversy about whether florists and bakers have to serve to people who are having same-sex weddings. And that was really great because we actually reached in that room a kind of compromised position that we could all sign on to. So that, that was very successful. Another one more recently was about the legalization of hard drugs. And There, the, of course, the funny thing was that my right-wing so-called uh, colleague was actually more in favor of decriminalization than I was. I actually have no, no very good arguments that heroin and methamphetamine and so on should be illegal, but that's what I feel in my gut. And my libertarian colleague just is a libertarian, and he thinks we should just get rid of the law. But we had a great discussion, and we, we did not come out in agreement, but we had a great discussion. So I think we just need more targeted discussions of the hard issues. 
I've agreed with the same colleague to do one in February on abortion. And that's going to be much harder, I think, because people are too dug into their position. But we'll see. We'll see what we can what we can come up with. But at least I think that format makes things go further. And more generally, I think wherever we are and whatever kind of educational institution we're in, we have to think what in the context of that institution is going to be a way to bring young people together in the context of civil and rational discussion so that they hear and really hear the voice of the other side. And um, I've had many wonderful experiences of that, and I hope they last a lifetime. You never know, but at least I can hope. Perhaps you'll need a particularly nice lunch for the abortion session. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Well, yes, of course, for me, because I am writing a book about animal rights oh. right now, I have very particular desiderata about the lunch that not everyone will agree. So even the lunch is subject to disagreement, I suppose. <laughs> um, Ugo asks, has a question, and uh, he, he says, uh, what do you think about the accumulation of fear in the general population as a result of the oppressive system uh, we live in uh, today? And he gives the example of uh, Julian Assange, uh, I, I understand, as a as an example of someone who has, is a victim of oppression. Uh, and, and this, he, he claims, Hugo claims, is, is generating rage. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about that case because it's much too complicated to go into in a short time. But I think in general, when people think the system is oppressive and in many different ways, many different people are right to feel that, then the crucial thing is that they can find as King helped people find a productive law-oriented strategy. I mean, King was, he knew that if there weren't a movement like his that demanded peaceful legal change, people would be rioting in the streets and they would achieve nothing. So he gave them an agenda and a strategy and specific laws that should be repealed, specific laws that should be passed and so on. Uh, and it made, a lot of headway, and of course we have a long way still to go. But the feminist movement too, and I, I think, you know, I, my my latest book, the one that the newspaper article talks about, is about sexual assault and sexual harassment and the long legal struggle against that. That was a totally non-violent struggle, and it did not uh, even get to the point of feeling, oh well, now we have to use violence. It worked always through law. And it achieved tremendous things. Most people think the Me Too movement of a few years back was the beginning of progress. Not at all. And so I wanted to tell the story of women who in the 1970s felt the criminal justice system was oppressive. We could not bring our rape accounts to the police, et cetera. And they set about changing the legal standard for rape. You used to have to prove that you resisted with overwhelming force, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if you said no, that was not enough. And so by 1980, case by case, they'd won the proposition that no means no. If you say no, and the person goes ahead anyway, that's rape. Now that was not enough because sometimes the woman doesn't say no because she's petrified with fear or she's in a context that's extortionate. Like the person says, sleep with me or I want to let you graduate from high school or something. So we have to have a notion of affirmative consent. So that was the next step. And we're getting there. It's a mess in the US because criminal law is different in every state. So some states have achieved this better than others. But then there's sexual harassment, which is something quite different. And people realize that in the workplace, a lot of things happened that were bad for women, but they weren't actually sexual assaults. They were just oppressive ways of demeaning women and of putting pressure on them and so on and so on. So Catherine McKinnon and an African-American law lawyer named Polly e. Murray had the brilliant idea that they would show that this was already illegal because it was sex discrimination as defined under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And of course they did that. And now every judge everywhere knows that sexual harassment is illegal, but it's a civil offense. And so to get a, a, a judgment, you have to bring the plaintiff 
is the, the woman, let's say, the state doesn't do it. I mean, the state doesn't indict anyone for sexual harassment. So the woman has to bring the charge, but the defendant is the employer. And the great sticking point is that even though the facts may be very bad, employers always try to say, oh, well, we're not liable because we posted signs saying don't harass women. So that's where we are now, trying to get the concept of employer liability adequately defined. But you know, there are many cases where women have won judgments against very powerful employers. One in our own Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, where General Electric in Indiana had one woman who was being just bullied and threatened and so on by the men. And she won a, a huge judgment against General Electric because they did nothing about that. So, so anyway, we, we've come a long way. We have a lot of distance further to go. And my book is called Citadels of Pride. Pride meaning in, in Dante's sense, the vice of thinking that you're above other people and that no one else is fully real. And there are places where pride is inured in a citadel and it's harder to get for the law to get at it. I look at the media and theater. I look at, uh, and including music, which I particularly love. I look at sports and I look at the federal judiciary because that's a, an interesting case because judges have, uh, I think, too much power over their clerks. Well, I just, these are just three examples of places where we need to go further and have better solutions. But anyway, you know, just working hard. And I mean, the women never despaired. The feminist movement has always been at bottom, a movement of hope and of progress. And even though people have accused McKinnon of being someone who hates men, et cetera, no, she really thinks men can change. I've taught with her and, you know, she's been a colleague. She really wants people to change. And a lot of people have now. I think you know, most men now understand what sexual harassment is, don't want to do it. The people who are charged with it are usually in some way pathological types in a university. And, uh, you know, so, so society does change and oppression can be uh, overthrown by peaceful incremental change. You could mention the lesbian and gay rights movement as another such example. Well, I mean, that has, lapped the feminist movement for various reasons. But I mean, in 1995, when I came to the University of Chicago, there were only two law students who were out as gay. <laughs> that was because firms wouldn't hire openly gay people. Well, two days ago, the National Football League had its first openly gay player. And luckily enough, uh, because he was a very good player, he, he did the decisive play that made his team win the game. And it was a, a defense power play, a strip sack. So this guy now is a hero and he's putting to one side all the stereotypes about gay men as weak and ineffectual in sports. So great, great for sports, finally. It took a long time, but it has finally happened. Can I just uh, butt in for, for a bit with a question of my own that is related to what I asked originally? It, what what would, you, would you say to someone who, who argued that putting that burden on people who are being oppressed of channeling their anger through what you call transitional anger for a long, long time is too much of a, of a burden? Well, what, <clears throat> what's the alternative? I mean, I think the you know, the alternative to King's movement was rioting in the streets. Would that have worked? No, because of course the police are always more powerful than the rioters and it would have just created, I mean, of course, Gandhi and King thought alike. Uh, they were thinking strategically as well as normatively. They knew that to behave with dignity in the face of violence created a better image for your group. So as Gandhi showed that Indian people were capable of self-government, by showing that they could restrain their anger. <laughs> King showed the same thing for African-Americans. So, you know, it would, I think it, it's the only alternative really. <clears throat> I can't think of, you know, of course Mandela did feel that a limited use of violence was essential at a certain point, but it was very limited. And it was, as I say, without retributive anger. So you need prudent and good strategic leadership. 
people shouldn't have to take the whole burden on themselves. Absolutely not. And sometimes the leadership comes from a great political leader like Mandela or Gandhi. But Gandhi was surrounded by other people that he needed. He needed a great political leader because he really wasn't, he knew nothing about politics. So Nehru was a necessary uh, part of Gandhi's movement, but also it needed law. And the great, I think the one I love most, and I'm teaching a seminar about modern Indian thought in the winter quarter, um, D.R. Ambedkar, the Dalit, who was the greatest legal thinker of the 20th century, who wrote the Indian constitution. And you know, to, to make progress, you need law. And he did that. He did it almost all, all by himself at first, but then of course he had to get the whole constituent assembly to accept it. So you need many different kinds of people and you need to get them working together. Now, what the genius of Gandhi was to find these people in different spheres and to get them working together. And that's what King to some extent did. And he collaborated with people in law like Thurgood Marshall, great legal thinker and judge. The feminist movement also, it needed people who were you know, activists leading protest marches, Gloria Steinem and so forth. It needed writers, again, Gloria Steinem, but also McKinnon. <clears throat> but then it needed people who were just lawyers for plaintiffs. And McKinnon was both. She actually wrote the brief in the first major Supreme Court sexual harassment case. But you, know, you have to ask, what is your talent and how can it fit together with others? And what makes a movement successful is that these different abilities can be coherently organized to achieve a result. And where you have that, then I think you really do gradually and steadily make progress. It doesn't always happen. And I, I think sometimes you just have a leadership vacuum. And I, my, my view, of course, does depend on there being leaders in the wings who will take things further. But, you know, we've been pretty lucky in my country to have always at any time leaders now African Americans are everywhere in our politics. In those states that I mentioned in my speech, good heavens, mayors, particularly mayors of Atlanta and so forth. And, uh, you know, great, great political leaders are coming from the South. And so that the South is not totally transformed, absolutely not. But it's very difficult to win a, an election in Georgia now. You know, as we have two Democratic senators from Georgia, one Jewish and one African American. <laughs> How did that happen? It just happened because people worked together. Stacey Abrams particularly played a very good role in leadership, getting people to cohere and turn out to vote and so forth. So, you know, it, 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 when people can get together, then really great things can happen. Jimena and Catalina ask questions that are much very related to what you just said. Uh, Jimena asks, who in, in a democracy is called to channel rage and to make that transition from rage to hope and, and change? And Catalina asks something similar. How do we get to, how do we promote uh, the, the, this, the, your thinking in a context in which there isn't a figure that guides us or inspires us, or perhaps there are just too many of them and they're too disseminated? Well, okay, in the last chapter of my book, The Monarchy of Fear, I talk about what are the practices of hope. And I think there are lots of different places in the society where hope and cooperative strategies for peaceful change are cultivated, and they're all different. One, for sure, is religion. Now, religion can promote bad things too, but as I say, in my city, if you want to ask where would people go to have a sense of getting together for compassion and peaceful change. It's the black churches. I mean, other churches too, but people who are hopeless um, are more likely in my city to be African-American and they have the black churches. Uh, we all have our choice to, to, to get tie up with a religious group. And Immanuel Kant said, we all have a duty to join a religious group of a peaceful sort because we're weak in isolation. And if we can join a religious group, then we feel stronger because we're together. No, I think that's good advice and I take that advice. I'm a member of my synagogue and I do a lot of social justice projects with the synagogue, but it's not necessary. There are other things people can do. 
they can, particularly the arts, I think, are a tremendous source of peaceful change. The arts give great and very powerful messages to the society. And they're also they more receptive, I think, than many social institutions of the contributions of outsiders. Not enough, not always, and so on. But, um, you know, it's quite, things are moving ahead. And the Chicago Children's Choir, which I've uh, studied and, and supported, is 80% of its members are below the poverty line. And those kids learn hope. And they don't just sing spirituals. They sing all kinds of different things, music from all over the world. And they learn the whole world could be theirs. And they learn what beauty and what wonderful sense of order can be created through the discipline of music. And so this is just one, one thing, you know, but there are many others. There's of course, um, public, public arts, like public architecture that gives people messages of hope. And then in education, of course, there are theories that can tell you what's wrong, why is it wrong? What do you need to do about it? And so on. I've spent much of my career creating such a theory, the capabilities approach, which I do think, you know, explains what's wrong in, uh, better than some other theories do, and then gives you things that each person can do something to work on, improving citizen capabilities in your society. Uh, so, you know, there that's another thing. And as I said before, in your own context, each person can just think, what can I do? A book group, uh, no spell lunch, just something that you can do to bring people together more and to give them less of a sense of powerlessness. Thank you. I do think that we're, political movements are another thing. I think a lot of people feel, oh, well, politics is just me, 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 me. Might as well forget about it. We have a very low voter turnout. And I think it's very important to get involved in politics someplace, uh, pick some figure that you particularly like. I've worked a lot for a congresswoman who's not from my own district named Lauren Underwood, who is a, a former nurse who's concerned with maternal health issues and so forth. She's in a district that's very evenly divided, so she needs support and help, you know, just working for Lauren, holding a fundraiser for her and so forth is, is one thing that one can always do. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nussbaum. We've reached the, the end of our time, and it's been a wonderful presentation. Very inspirational, too, and uh, I'm sure that we've all learned much from your, your wisdom. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Well, thanks very much, and I hope I'll see you at some point in the not-too-distant future in Chile. So, so thank you. Thank so you for your questions. I really enjoyed them a lot, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks again. Y muchas gracias a todos ustedes por acompañarnos, los que están aquí presentes en el, en el auditorio, como también quienes nos han acompañado por streaming. Les contamos que esta actividad quedará disponible en la Mediateca Digital de Puerto de Ideas, en puertodeideas.cl y en el canal de YouTube de la Facultad de Historia, Geografía y Ciencia Política de la Universidad Católica. Thanks again, Professor Nussman. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye.